for our conclusion, um, I would like to introduce my partner, That's Peter Strauss, see, uh, one of the over. founders of Elder Law and Special Needs Planning. And I don't say that lightly or pejoratively. He is actually one of the founders of both disciplines in the bar. And I've learned a great deal from Peter, and I'm sure that you will, too, as he explores the issues of the Lockwood family. Okay. Lee makes my head spin. <laughs> um, he's always on point and he's really very exciting to listen to as are all our speakers, but he makes my head spin. So I have 20 minutes now that let's not call that age discrimination. Um, it's it's sort of a, to, to demonstrate that when we're doing planning in this context of Marcus and Kim, we don't want to leave out the reality that they have parents, they have children, the parents may be ill, the children may have disabilities. So we don't have time to go into all the strategies, but that's really an important part of this kind of planning for any planning. And, you know, um, the background, and I'll go through this very quickly, is that we're living longer, um, but that's the good news. The bad news is we're not necessarily living well. And this slide tells you that at age 85, 50% of us will not be functioning well. So if I drew a line from Karen back to the coffee pot, one side of the room will be playing golf at my age, which is 87. And the other half of you will be in an assisted living facility or needing full-time care at home. That's pretty scary. And the other reality is that if you're lucky enough to have heart problems, Medicare pays for most of the costs of your medical care. But if you have dementia, you're on your own. So how wealthy do you have to be to be able to afford this? So we're gonna talk about Joyce, who's older. She has some signs of memory issues. So that may mean some dementia. That may mean she's gonna need expensive long-term care later on. Um, she needs to take control. We all need to take control of our lives. We need to do the advanced planning. This is what we call in the firm, the core five. You can read it. I just want to tell you why trusts are so important by saying that we just got a notice late Friday night from the court electronic system that a will we filed for probate in New York County seven months ago was admitted to probate. Seven months. That's not good. We need trust. Your clients need trust. Don't say, oh, I don't do, I don't do revocable trust. Wills are fine. They're not so fine. For tax reasons, they may be okay, but but for probate reasons, they're not. Okay. So now let's talk about Joyce. They want to marry. They've been together 10 years. Um, we know that Joyce has these memory problems. We don't know a lot about Barbara, but for the purposes of my discussion, which is unfortunately going to have to be cut short because we don't have a lot of time, um, assume that she may also have signs of early dementia. And let's assume she's got about $500,000 of liquid assets. She's living in Joyce's condo, okay? So just generally for all of us, what are the options? This slide tells us what are the options to pay for long-term care, starting with private pay. We've heard about long-term care insurance, reverse mortgages, selling your life insurance, borrowing against your life insurance, accelerated benefits options, um, maybe even a reverse mortgage as Frank's discussed. And by the way, you can't get reverse mortgages on co-ops in, in New York state or anywhere. But there is legislation that was passed waiting for the governor's signature. Not so sure she's going to sign it right away. But Frank thinks that maybe within the next year, we will be able to get reverse mortgages on co-ops. And that will be a big benefit for seniors. That's another source of funding for long-term care. And finally, 
There's Medicaid. Medicaid, which I call the payer of last resort, and I'm gonna to come to that in a, in a few minutes, but I wanna talk about this question of whether Joyce should marry Barbara. Joyce is our client, okay? So let's look at some of the factors. The benefits, the emotional, physical, and social supports of, their, of a couple being together. Now they've been together for 10 years, so that factor is there. By the way, at the bottom you'll see a reference to an article in Sunday's Times that 30% of Americans are now living alone. That's an amazing statistic. Barbara and Joyce don't live alone. They're together, they have that support. If they marry, Joyce will get, at the time of Barbara's death, depending on her social security income, if it's higher than Joyce's, that's a benefit. She'll get Joyce's social security. Um, she also might get a portion of any um, IRAs or retirement plans that Barbara has. ERISA issues may come in here. They may, or there may be an obligation. I'm not an ERISA expert, so I don't know whether uh, Barbara would be grandfathered in, but I'm assuming that she would voluntarily make her a beneficiary. There might be income tax savings. Um, and Barbara may have an obligation to support Joyce. They're married now. And that's important when we look at the question of the disadvantages of the marriage. The biggest disadvantage for Joyce is the fact that she acquires an obligation to support Barbara, just as Barbara has an obligation to support her. Now, I had on a prior slide, I think, the question of should they have a prenuptial agreement? Parties can have, under the domestic relations law and the general obligations law, prenuptial agreements that waive certain marital rights. Arissa, you've got extra steps, but section 5-311 of the general obligations law, you can't waive an obligation of support if the party will become a public charge. So if one of them goes on Medicaid, even if they had a prenuptial agreement, that's not gonna help. Medicaid would still have the right to seek contribution from the, well, let me go back to that slide, um, from the spouse that has some assets. Um, so in this case, let me just note, since Joyce only has $60,000 of liquid assets, and she is entitled under the Medicaid laws of what's called the Community Spouse Resource Allowance, which in 2023 will be up to $148,000, and she's only got 60, her 60,000 is protected. So in this particular circumstance, which is unusual that she only has $60,000 of liquid assets, the obligation of support issue is less than if she had half a million or 750,000 or even $350,000, okay? So um, that's basically what the message is from this slide. So what's the option for Joyce? Joyce could, and any, any person in these situations could, whether they're married or they're single, Medicaid becomes the payer of last resort. You don't have a reverse mortgage to tap. You don't have insurance to tap. You don't have high income. You don't have, you're not, you're not Kim or Marcus who will unlikely never need Medicaid, all right? And they have long-term care insurance. Now, Joyce has, so this is a factor on the question of whether they should marry. She's got a good long-term care insurance policy she might acquire some additional income later on. And she has Kim who might support her. And I will come to that in a minute. But these are serious issues. And Barbara, Barbara could, could need Medicaid as well. We don't know what the future will bring, but these two women 
have some signs of medical issues and we need to think about it. Okay, now, what is spousal refusal? If you're married and Joyce has limited assets, when Barbara has $500,000 and Joyce files for Medicaid, because they are married, the Medicaid office deems Barbara's wealth, her $500,000, as belonging to Joyce, as if Joyce owned that $500,000, and therefore she's over the exemption amount of approximately $23,000, which it will be in 2023. Therefore, she's not eligible because they treat it as belonging to Joyce. However, if Barbara signs a statement, I cannot afford to use my assets to support Joyce, that's called spousal refusal, and that prevents Medicaid from deeming the assets to Joyce, and it would work the same way if the other had assets, okay? Now, what's the consequence of spousal refusal? Joyce gets Medicaid, but Barbara, by virtue of signing that statement, has created an implied contract of support, allowing the county or New York City HRA to sue Barbara for support. Will they do that? Case by case basis. There are ways to get around that. New York City doesn't sue everyone. I would say if Kim filed for Medicaid, they would sue her, certainly. Um, but in this case, it's not a sure thing, but it's something we need to think about. So what I wanna do, oh, I went the wrong way. This is counterintuitive. The left goes forward and the right goes backwards. So, okay. By the way, these are the Medicaid numbers for eligibility. What you're allowed to have is exempt resources. They're gonna go up substantially in New York to some extent, uh, largely because of the acceptance of uh, Governor Koch, Koch, Hochul uh, to the advocacy of the elder attorneys in NILAG in New York. Some of the benefits have gone up by, by 50%. It's just quite remarkable. Um, okay. So Joyce doesn't have many countable assets. She basically has 60,000. Her condo is her primary residence. It's exempt, it's not counted, but it would be part of her probate estate and Medicaid would have a right of recovery later on. We wanna deal with that. Her IRA is exempt because it's in payout status. There's a problem of her having too much income because of her retired uh, required minimum distribution. I'll try to touch on that if I can. And she has this good partnership policy. However, she should protect the 60,000 cash, except for the 23,000 that's gonna be exempt. And she should protect her home because you don't want it to be in her name when she dies. Otherwise, Medicaid will have a right of recovery against her probate estate. There's no right of recovery against non-probate assets, only probate assets. So um, in this example, she funds a trust, which I'm gonna talk about in a minute. She has excess income because if you're a poor person on Medicaid in 2023, you're only allowed to keep $1,583. Her income is 2,800. She's gotta put the excess in what's called a pool trust run by a not-for-profit organization which can pay her bills with that money. So we don't have to give that excess income back to the state. All of this, by the way, is legal. Okay. Um, so here's the major strategy that can be used for either a single person or if they get married, uh, one or both of the, of the joint persons. And it's again, very fact specific. This is an irrevocable trust. You put in assets in that trust you, the person who wishes to apply for Medicaid, is the income beneficiary. You cannot have the trustee with a right to, to invade principal for that Medicaid applicant income beneficiary. So there is some loss of control, but there's a workaround, and it is legal. 
The trustee who has to be really independent, can't be a spouse. Um, the trustee has the right to make principal distributions to other family members, the next generation, cousins, uncles, and aunts. I wouldn't suggest their attorney, but it's theoretically possible. And that money then can, quote, voluntarily be used to pay for Joyce's expenses, which he's, are not covered out of her income. And it works. And then upon the death of Joyce as the beneficiary of that Medicaid Asset Protection Trust, the assets pass to whoever she wants the assets to go to. And there is no right of recovery because it's a non-probate asset. Um, so these slides essentially tell you, um, you know, more detail about the Medicaid Asset Protection Trust. Um, now, in this overall situation of the Marcus Kim family and the business, maybe the best solution, depending on the views of the parties, is that Kim, and this has to be built into the calculations about the settlement in their divorce, creates a supplemental needs trust for her mother, Joyce. The Supplemental Needs Trust is created by Kim with Kim's funds. Kim could be the trustee, Marcus could be the trustee, maybe Marsha could be the trustee, maybe co-trustee with the bank. A lot of banks will be willing to do this. And that trust can be used to provide for the medical care, the home care, and possibly even the nursing home care that Joyce might need later on. And remember, at this point, Kim could get an income tax deduction because Kim may then be, in effect, paying more than half of the support for her mother. We have to look at the numbers. We don't know what it'll be. But with nursing homes, you know, at 20000 plus, at least in New York City and upstate, not quite as much, but certainly a lot of money, that could be a significant deduction as well. Now, a couple of other issues I want to toss out, I had them on an earlier slide, which I didn't think I had the time. But while I remember, uh, you're telling me it's, I'm out of time, Tim? What? Five, okay, yeah, you're sitting in front of that spotlight, so I couldn't quite see your hand. Um, if Joyce is gonna be your lawyer, I'm sorry, if you're gonna be Joyce's lawyer in doing this planning, what's the ethical obligation with respect to Barbara? Are you representing both of them? Or is this premarital planning? Then there'd be no privilege. There'd be no obligation to share everything. You would have a joint representation letter. Probably at this stage, you're gonna be just representing Joyce. What's your obligation to Barbara? Do you have to tell Barbara, even though you're not representing her, that she might have an obligation to support Joyce? To what extent is that gonna influence her decision to marry Joyce. Um, so there are these ethical issues involved here. And how much do you all really know about the intricacies of this? I haven't even gotten to some of the, the problems that could come up, but there's serious ethical and professional issues here uh, in terms of doing this counseling. And then there's the issue, you know, the moral and ethical issue, whether you know, is Medicaid appropriate for, for Joyce? I mean, with her wealthy family, but that's not her money. She's really close to being eligible for Medicaid right now. And if she needs it, why not? She's paid her taxes. The failure is not in the fact that it's wrong because, you know, some people get it and some people don't. It's that the system itself is wrong. Medicare needs reformation to include long-term care. But when was the last time you heard any politician say what I just said? And why don't they say it? Why don't they call for Medicare reform? Because of budgetary reasons. You know what the cost would be? I mean, I think the number of the percentage of the New York state budget is, is what, about 60% is Medicaid? 60% of the New York budget is Medicaid. 
because we pay for long-term care in New York. We have a generous Medicaid home care program. It's become tougher to access. It's, it's not as great as it was. There are all kinds of new laws. In fact, there's a new law that's going into effect sometime mid or early 2024 that will create a two and a half year look back period for community Medicaid. There's two kinds of Medicaid now. Chronic care, which is nursing home Medicaid, community Medicaid. I mean, there's a lot of our different programs, but essentially you're in a nursing home or you're getting Medicaid benefits at home, home care. We have a generous Medicaid home care program. Classically, there's been a five-year look-back period for nursing home Medicaid, meaning that if you're in a nursing home and you gave money away within the previous five years of being admitted and applying for Medicaid in a nursing home, you may have a penalty depending on the amount that you gave away and what the county says is the average cost or the state says is the average cost in you know, Cayuga County. So if you gave away $100,000 and the average cost factor was 10,000, you had a 10 month waiting period. May have passed, but it won't pass if you're in a nursing home because the period starts when you go to the nursing home and apply for Medicaid, not when you gave the money away. We never had a look at community Medicaid, but we do have a new law that was supposed to have gone into effect in 20, but it's been deferred because of the federal COVID-19 pandemic. We're now told it'll probably be April 1st of 2024. So if you have clients that you think should be doing a Medicaid Asset Protection Trust, you've got a little more time for why we had to tell clients it was going to be December 31st of this year. Then we told them it was going to be April 1st of next year. Now we've gotten more time, but you never know. So don't wait. So. My final slide, I know it's that because it says conclusion. Um, they need to do the core five. They got to have all those documents, the healthcare proxy living will, which we, we do as a combined document. If whatever trusts are appropriate, of course, pour over wills. Um, every one of our clients needs to be consider the needs of their aging parents. And you have to always have flexibility, not just because tax laws change, but because people's marriages change. And there's always the possibility of divorce, et cetera. Um, this is a tough area. And we also have to deal with stubborn older folks who say, I don't need it, I don't wanna do anything. I, not only do I not wanna to go to the doctor, I don't wanna to go to the lawyer, that's even worse than going to the doctor. And somehow I discovered, cause I tripped and fell in the office one day that my Apple watch after 10 seconds said, looks like you fell. If you don't push the button in 10 seconds, we're calling 911. So if your parents refuse to get one of those buttons, where emergency buttons, buy them an Apple Watch for their birthday. Thank you very much.